Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Today's presentation is motivated by some comments I got on a recent video that I posted where I showed how the Earth would look like with rising sea levels. And not surprisingly, a uh, few people complained in uh, the comments that kind of remark you get quite often when talking about subjects uh, such as climate change. Though I have to say uh, the complaints were not so many. And some of them complained about the fact that I showed uh, sea level rises that were greatly exaggerated. Actually, I made this video as a byproduct of these uh, videos I made recently on asteroid impacts on the Earth and someone suggested I use a digital elevation model to improve the simulation and while testing these uh, digital elevation models it occurred to me that it would be a nice way of showing uh, the effect of changing sea levels. And just to make things look more interesting, I showed sea levels rising by up to 1,000 meters, which is, of course, way beyond anything that would happen, even if all the ice in the glaciers and polar ca caps would melt. So, okay, but that kind of criticism I, I can understand. But there's another type of remark I, I got, which was mere, more like some disbelief or skepticism about uh, some measurements I showed on actual sea level changes. So let's look at these in a bit more detail. So here are some uh, things you can find online. So first of all, there is a, a measurement result that shows that between the beginning of the 20th century and uh, about now, the global mean sea level has risen by uh, something between 15 and 25 centimeters or 6 and 10 inches. These figures are not very precise because uh, the early measurements are, were not so precise. But okay, it amounts to an average of 1 to 2 millimeters per year. But then we have more precise, more recent data. For instance, in a period of 25 years, the, the rise has been a bit less than 10 centimeters or 3.8 inches, averaging at 3.8 millimeters per year. And for an even more recent period of 10 years, we get 46 millimeters or so about 4.6 millimeters per year. So. These data indicate that sea levels have risen, have increased, and the increase is accelerating. So you see here a, a graph with uh, these data. And you see, of course, there are fluctuations. And uh, they, they have a certain importance in the data. But still, uh, despite this fluctuation, you see this increase so between uh, 1880 and 2020 of something like uh, 25 centimeters. Now, another point is predictions and predictions for uh, 2100 range from something like, mm -hmm. so compared to the year 2000, an increase between uh, 0 0.6 meters and 2.2 .2 meters, all depending on how much greenhouse gases we emit. And this is now uh, related to modeling, so it's, it's a different thing, and I uh, am not going to talk about this in, in this presentation. So my point here is to talk about these uh, measurements of changes in sea level in the past. And so, so one uh, criticism I got in a comment was to say, OK, we we have these increases of a few centimeters, but this is uh, actually way below the, uh, the margin of error you make in measurements. And I can indeed understand this, uh, this remark because, well, 
if, uh, for instance, you you had some uh, physics practica at school, you learn all about the importance of quantifying the er errors in measurement. And of course, the global seas are a complicated system with lots of perturbations, so it seems difficult to measure these things with that type of accuracy. But, okay, I uh, let's look uh, uh, at the thing in a little bit more detail and see where these data come from. So, uh, first of all, how do we measure sea levels? Well, there are different ways of doing it. So, for instance, you have many local stations on coasts or near coasts, and these have existed uh, since the end of the 19th century, uh, especially in cities where you have a lot of tides and uh, so this is very important for naval traffic, so uh, people have been measuring tides and computing them and comparing things and uh, so you get rather precise measurements of the sea level in these places. And more recently, since the early 1990s, so for about 30 years, we've had also satellite measurements. So these are satellites such as uh, the first was Topex, Poseidon, and then we had Jason 1, 2, 3, and there are a few other satellites that orbit the Earth and measure the sea levels by radar. And this also provides data which are more precise. So just to give a few examples, so this is the kind of data you find online which show anomalies, so these are deviations from the average, so for instance here in the Atlantic Ocean you see quite nicely deviations which I think are due to the Gulf Stream, so the Gulf Stream in this area here is uh, warmer and so uh, seawater expands and uh, it's a bit higher than in the North Atlantic. So another example would be uh, so here, so that's in uh, 2016, so here we have a, okay, a global picture of uh, anomalies, so deviations from the mean, and uh, here's another one with the uh, uh, Pacific and uh, part of the Atlantic Ocean. And here's a very recent one from uh, this year, 2023, and I believe this anomaly here uh, that is due to El Nino, which you have probably heard has been particularly important this year, causing all kinds of uh, disruptions in climate, like the recent heat wave we've had in, in Brazil. All right, so now, how do we uh, measure, how do we describe uh, sea levels? So, local sea levels, so that would be the sea level measured at a particular point. That is, of course, changing a lot over time, and that is due to several factors. So, a first factor that uh, would be waves. So due to wind and storms, and uh, that has a period of about, uh, well, if you look at waves on the seashore, it's uh, a few seconds, maybe 10 seconds to one minute, give or take. And these uh, have an amplitude which can go from a few dozen centimeters to several meters or maybe several tens of meters uh, in the open sea. So, so that is one type of uh, time change. Then we have tides and uh, okay, tides have a period of about 12 hours uh, 25 minutes and I'm sure you all know this is due to the influence of the moon and tides uh, in some places can also have very important impacts of uh, several dozen meters depending on the shape of the the bottom of the sea then we also have uh, perturbations due to uh, the atmospheric pressure that changes with weather so here the time scale would be more like a few days 
And also the local gravitation has an effect on the sea level and uh, the local gravitation depends on uh, well, the shape of the earth, the bottom of the ocean and so on. And we also have uh, seasonal uh, va variations so, uh, of, of, the, of the weather. So, uh, okay, there will be differences between uh, winter and summer. So all these things make it difficult to define uh, the local sea level at a given point uh, and a given time. However, what we are interested in are mean sea le levels. So by mean, we mean that we average it over the surface of all oceans. So mathematically, that would be given by an integral, but you can think of it as measuring the sea level at many different points or maybe some lattice of points and taking the average of that. And also we can take averages over time intervals because we're not really interested in the sea level at every second, but maybe we want to take an average over a day or a period of several days that will, will be perfectly enough for the kind of things we want to describe. And the point I'm trying to make here is that taking averages actually makes measurement less dependent on errors. And we will see how. So here are just, uh, again, some uh, examples. Uh, so these are measurements that uh, have been made by, by satellites, starting with the uh, Topex, Poseidon, and then there were three different JSON satellites with some overlap in the curve. And well, you, you see, there are some differences between the curves, and uh, there's also some quite good overlap in this region. It's a bit different, and you see, there's some variability, uh, but it looks like the, the variation here is still. Uh, smaller than the overall increase we see in this picture. And here is still another picture with uh, even more uh, satellites. So <coughs> there's a whole, uh, uh, whole family of satellites that have been used for these measurements. All right, so let's think about this uh, question of measuring uh, a signal and we will first think about a periodic signal that we are going to sample over a certain period of time. So here my periodic signal, uh, let me assume it has this simple form, so A0 plus A1 times a co uh, cosine, so phi here is, uh, is some uh, phase shift, omega is uh, the ang angular frequency, so the period of the signal is this 2 pi over omega, and the, the average x bar here will, will be a naught. So this a naught is the quantity we want to determine for measurements. Now let us assume that we sample the signal at times which are multiples of a certain time interval delta, so the sampling frequency is this lowercase omega, which is 2 pi over delta. And by sampling, what I mean is this, so I will call the average over n samples this quantity x bar n, so where I measure the signal at times p delta, where p goes from 0 to n minus 1, and I divide by n. So the question is, how close will this be to the actual average, which is a naught? Well, uh, the first thing we can observe is that if I split x of t in a naught and the periodic part, so the a naught part will simply give me a naught, what I'm looking for. And the other part will give me a1 times 1 over n times the sum p going from 0 to n minus 1. And here we'll have the cosine of phi plus p omega times delta. 
Okay, and we are interested in this Rn, which is a measure of the, the error we are making. Okay, so this Rn we can compute, and one uh, useful trick here is to use uh, complex coordinates, complex uh, numbers. So I can write it as 1 over n times the real part of the sum p going from 0 to n minus 1 of exponential i phi plus p times omega times delta. Now, here I can use uh, something called a geometric sequence. So I can use the fact that if x is some complex number, I want to compute 1 plus x plus x square and so on up to x to the power n minus 1. And I multiply this by 1 minus x. I get a telescopic sum. Many terms will cancel and the result will be 1 minus x to the n. And so I can use this to find the sum 1 plus x up to x to the n minus 1. That will be given by 1 minus x to the n divided by 1 minus x provided x is different from 1. Now, if x is equal to 1, the sum will simply be equal to capital N. So, let us use this here. So, so I have two cases, depending on whether uh, this x I, I'm using here, uh, so which will be the exponential of i omega delta is equal to 1 or not. So, if not, what I get is 1 over n times the real part of exponential i phi, 1 minus exponential i n omega delta, divided by 1 minus exponential i omega delta. Right, And this is if exponential i omega delta is different from 1. And if it is equal to 1, well, we will get uh, so, so a sum which is equal to n, which will cancel with the n in front. So we will just be left with the real part of exponential i phi, which is the cosine of phi. So that is if exponential i omega delta is equal to 1. So what happens here is easy to understand. So actually the, the second case is if we sample the signal with a period which is a multiple of the period of the signal and then of course we will just see always the same size, the same value. And this is because exponential i omega delta is equal to 1 if and only if omega delta is a multiple of 2 pi and <coughs> this is equivalent to so if I use the uh, definition here of uh, this omega I can write this as the ratio of the two omegas being equal to q or I can express everything with delta and t, it's the same as delta over t equal q, that's a capital T, or delta equal the multiple of t. So that's my resonance condition here. So what this says is that if I sample the signal with exactly its period or multiple of this period, 
I, I will actually get a result, which is A0 plus A1 times cos phi, so it's different from the average I want to measure. Now, if we can be a bit more precise uh, on the case if exponential I omega delta is different from 1, we can uh, approximate this, uh, this error here. So this Rn, well, it will be smaller than, so we can just uh, use upper bounds on uh, complex exponentials and so on. So it will be smaller than, uh, so, so the exponential here I can just by, bound by 1, the numerator I can bound by 2. So I'm left with 2 divided by n, uh, and I've already written, so 1 minus exponential i omega delta. Now, what this means is that if I'm not in a resonant case, so if this condition is satisfied, then this error decreases like a constant divided by n. Now, you may want to argue, but what if I'm not in the resonant case, but very close to resonance. Well, that we can analyze as well. So we can make here a little computation. So compute the, this modulus squared of, of this denominator. And, well, we can just compute so uh, by writing real part imaginary part, so that is 1 minus cos of omega delta squared, uh, the square outside, plus the sinus of omega delta squared. And this, if I expand and, and simplify, use some trig identities, that is 2 times 1 minus cos omega delta. And that is uh, the same as 4 sinus squared of omega, so delta omega over 2. So what I get here is that this error I make here is bounded by, so 2, uh, actually it simpl simplifies to 1 over n, times the sine of omega delta over 2. And now in case omega times delta is close to resonance, so let's say that is a multiple of 2 pi plus a small difference epsilon, well in that case we get so, so the sine will be uh, close to uh, omega delta over 2, so, uh, so actually epsilon over 2. So we get that Rn is smaller equal 2 over n epsilon. So what this tells us is that if we want the error to be small and we are close to resonance, we should take n, the number of measurements, large compared to 1 over epsilon. So what we've seen so far is that if we take a sufficiently large number of measurements, unless we are exactly at resonance, we will be able to get a good approximation of the average value. Now, uh, one thing you, you may uh, argue is that this was a particular case where I just have a cosine. So in general, what I will have, if my signal is per periodic with period capital T, I can expand it as a Fourier series. So it will be given by A0 plus A1 times the cosine of some phase shift phi 1 times um, plus omega t. And then I will have harmonics, so I will have a2 times cosine of phi 2 plus 
omega t and so on so and now my my resonance condition will be given by a uh, delta is actually a, a multiple of t over k. So I, I get more resonances and that's because I have all these harmonics that have smaller periods and whenever my sampling period is a multiple of one of these smaller periods, I can get a resonance. Okay, so if for instance, uh, delta is equal to t over k for a given k. So what are the, the resonant terms? Well, they, they are given by uh, frequencies which are k, 2k, and so on. And then what I will get is that x bar n, that's so the average uh, of over n samples, it will get it will contain so some resonant parts that contain all the amplitudes of harmonics and then we will have a remainder which will be this 1 over n and then some over j which are not multiples of k and uh, we will have this aj and uh, as before x 1 minus exponential i and j omega delta over 1 minus exponential i j omega delta. And this second term we can treat as before, so it will decrease like 1 over n, possibly with a small constant in the denominator if we are very close to a resonance. But the, the important terms are the following here. So what uh, happens here, what actually helps, is the following thing, which is that typically the amplitudes of the harmonics decrease with k. So, for instance, if you have a square wave, that's a basic exercise you do in uh, Fourier series. For a square wave, uh, you have that a k is smaller than a constant over k. And if you have a smoother wave, the decrease is even faster. So if it's a differentiable function, it goes like c over k squared, and the smoother the function is, the faster it decays. So what this means is typically you want to take a sampling period which is small compared to the period of the signal. And then the resonances you can get are actually something of the form ak but with ak quite large and uh, in that case this relation here tells you that you will make an error but it will be quite small. Now to sum up what we've seen so far is that if we have a periodic signal and we sample it at regular time intervals we Either we are in a resonant situation or we are in a non-resonant situation and then the error we make dec uh, decreases like a constant over capital N, the number of measurements. Now, there are a number of fixes for, for this, which are well known in signal processing. So one thing you can do is you can try to change the sampling frequency, so make measurements for different sampling frequencies and then you will be able to avoid resonances. You can also randomize the sampling times that will also avoid resonances. Or in many cases, like for these waves, uh, we talked about tides, for instance. Well, tides are a periodic component of waves, but it is well known, so we can remove these periodic components, perhaps also doing some Fourier analysis at the beginning, and so 
actually in one of the graphics I showed they write that they removed the seasonal variations. And another point is that all in all these cases if we have a really a periodic signal we get a bias but this bias is always the same and if we're interested not in the absolute global mean uh, sea level but in how it changes over time if the error we make here is always the same it will not affect differences so differences in mean sea level so actually these periodic perturbations are, are not really a problem but now one can argue that there are also errors we make which are maybe errors in measurements or errors during to the waves uh, behaving in a somewhat chaotic way and there it makes more sense to model this by uh, random variables instead of a periodic signal. So how about random variables? Now a, a classical example of that is uh, let's assume we are playing at heads or tails, we are throwing a coin and we're not sure whether the coin is uh, fair or biased so we want to determine what's the probability to have heads for instance just by throwing the coin. So what this means is that we have random variables x1, x2 and so on which are independent and identically distributed IID and so XI is the result of the ith uh, coin throw and we will have that the probability of XI is equal to 1 that will be given by P so let's say that is heads and the probability of XI being 0 it's 1 minus p, that will be tails. And what we are measuring is Sn, that will be 1 over n, the sum i going from 1 to n of xi. So what is this? Well, the sum of the xi, that is the number of heads, and I divide by n, so that will be the proportion of heads. So for instance I can throw my coin a hundred times and I get uh, 60 heads and so Sn will be 60 over 100 that will be 0 0.6 so that's the proportion of heads. Now let us compute a few things. So first of all the expectation of Xi which is the, sa the same for all i because the distribution is the same for all these random variables where that is p times 1 plus 1 minus p times 0 so that is p and I can also compute the expectation of xi squared where that is similar p times 1 squared plus 1 minus p times 0 squared and that's, so that's also p and that tells me that the variance of xi, so that is the expectation of xi squared minus the square of the expectation, so that is p minus p squared, which I can also write as p times 1 minus p. So that is a number between 0 and 1 quarter, so the maximal value 1 quarter is reached when p is equal to 1 half. Now from, from this, so that's smaller than a quarter, and what I, can I do with this? Well, I can compute the expectation of Sn, and that by linear, linearity of the expectation, that is 1 over n the sum of all the expectations so it's 1 over n times n p so that's just p so s n has the same expectation as all the x i and the variance of s n that is given by 
Now the variance is a quadratic form, so that will be 1 over n squared times the variance of the sum. Now the xi being independent, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances, so that will be 1 over n, and the sum of the n squared and the sum of the variances will just be n times p times 1 minus p. So this simplifies to p times 1 minus p over n, and that is less or equal to 1 over 4n. So the important point here is the fact that the variance of Sn decreases with n. And one way you can use this, that is called Chebyshev's inequality, and that tells me that the probability that Sn minus p absolute value is larger than some positive delta, that is less or equal 1 over delta squared times the variance of Sn. And so that is p times 1 minus p over, so uh, that is uh, n times delta squared, delta squared times n. Okay, and this I can also bound by 1 over 4 delta squared n. So what this tells me is that as I increase delta, it becomes less and less likely to observe values of Sn that are very different from uh, its expectation. So if I put here the, so the, so the, the value of Sn, and uh, here it's, its probability density. I have P here, and the probability density will look something like this, some kind of bell-shaped curve, and the width here, the width uh, is proportional, so I look for which delta uh, this becomes small, and so delta square has to be large compared to uh, to 1 over n, and so the width is proportional to 1 over square root of n. Now, one remark I want to make here is that this is a good approximation for deltas which are relatively small, so of this order 1 over square root of n, but actually if I look for larger deviations, the probability decreases much faster than this 1 over delta squared. So let me look at the case p equals 1 half for simplicity, and then the thing yeah, that you can show is that the probability that Sn minus 1 half is larger than delta is actually smaller than exponential minus n times a function S of delta, and this function S of delta is given by one half plus delta times log one plus two delta plus one half minus delta times log one minus two delta, and that is what is called the entropy of uh, this random variable. And if I plot the graph of this function, it is, 
So I have delta here, s of delta here. It is zero for delta equals zero, and then it, it grows something like this. And the point here is that actually I have this decrease for, so for increasing uh, delta, which is actually exponential in n. So this doesn't change uh, the fact that the fluctuations have this size, uh, which are 1 over square root of n. But what it does change is that for deviations which are much larger than the square root of n, actually the, the probability decreases much faster than this bound I obtained from Chebyshev's inequality. And I'm not going to tell you how you obtain this relation, but I actually uh, spoke about that in a, another tutorial that was on irreversibility. So let me just say that it uses some inequality which is called Chernoff's inequality instead of Chebyshev's inequality, which is in some cases more precise, that gives better results. Now, one uh, remarks, uh, so one thing we can say about this uh, measuring the bias of a coin is that it's actually very close to what you do uh, in polling. So if there's an upcoming election and you want to estimate what people are going to vote, what you do is you do a poll. But let's say there are uh, 100 million people that are going to vote. It would be too expensive to ask all of them what they are going to vote. So typically, you ask uh, maybe a thousand people. And then there's all this problem of finding a confidence interval, depending on uh, the number of people you ask and, and their answers. And well, this confidence interval will have a size that scales like one over square root of n. So if n is a, th a thousand, it will be roughly 1 over 30, which is actually not so small. So it will be something like 3% uh, three po three more or less. So that's this problem that uh, if you do a poll, if the number of people you ask is not very large, you're not able to obtain a very small confidence interval of the result. But the more people you ask, the smaller your confidence interval will be. Now, this is related, uh, so this can be generalized to other random variables, and it's related to something called variance reduction. So let's just look at what happens in more general cases. So again, we have independent identically distributed random variables x1, x2, and so on. And let's now assume that their common expectation is some quantity mu, and that their common variance is some co quantity sigma squared. And then again we compute Sn, which is 1 over n times the sum j going from 1 to n of xj. Then by the same a similar argument as before, the expectation of Sn will be again mu, and the variance of Sn, so this here is a xi, the variance of Sn is given by sigma squared over n by exactly the same scaling argument for the variance. So this was an xi here. And again, using Chebyshev's inequality, we get this uh, result that probability that Sn minus 
the expectation that you want to determine that probability that that is larger than delta will be smaller than sigma squared over n times delta squared. And that gives us again a confidence interval that has a size that goes like uh, so 1 over square root of n. Now, and you can do something similar when uh, if you have uh, additional properties of these random variables uh, similar to this uh, large deviation estimate, so showing that actually the decrease for very large deviations is much faster than this decrease in 1 over n over delta squared. Now, <coughs> let us go back to these uh, satellite measurements. So here's a picture for one of these JSON satellites. So it has orbited the Earth for over 10 years in uh, an orbit that looks something like this. So uh, it's not at all a geostationary orbit. It's much, much lower altitude. So it, it goes over the, uh, the Earth between two latitudes in uh, something cyclic, but it's in such a way that it covers a large area of the Earth. And so how, uh, how can we describe this? So let us now look at this x of t, which would be the measurement that the satellite gets for uh, the height of, of the sea below it. So the way the satellites work is that they send radar waves and uh, so measure the time uh, until uh, the reflection. And that gives a certain measurement of the height of the ocean at the particular point where the satellite is at this particular time. And now, uh, well, this will be given by some, uh, so a sum of periodic signals. Okay, and that's, let's say, x sum over i of x periodic i of t. So this would include periodic uh, signals like, well, for instance, the orbit of the satellite should be close to a circle, but maybe it's not a perfect circle. So, so uh, it was very slightly elliptic. So we have the orbit of the satellite that enters here. But this variation should be periodic, and it's known with some high degree of precision uh, thanks to GPS, which, by the way, is uh, has become much more precise. So it used to be maybe a few meters, but nowadays it's the precision is uh, less than a meter for GPS data, and it improves over longer time intervals. So this we know quite precisely. And then there can also be variations uh, like the tides. And OK, maybe some other large scale periodic va variations, so maybe seasonal variations, and so on. And but then we we have here uh, some noise here, uh, depending on time. And this in this noise, we would put all the things uh, that we cannot uh, put in these uh, well understood periodic components. So it could be of, for instance, uh, the slightly chaotic motions of the waves. It could be all kinds of measurement errors due to the instruments of the satellite. It could also be the composition of the atmosphere that changes a little bit, that has an effect on the signal, and so on. So, okay, one thing is that here I'm talking just about the time signal, the signal as a function of time, that's what the satellite sees. But as I said before, we are interested in averages over space. But since our satellite is uh, 
really covering a large part of the Earth, averages over time intervals and over space, if you wait long enough, will give comparable results. So you can just look at this time average of this uh, signal here, and that should that will give us a good uh, approximation of the space average. Now, how about the error due to this noise term here? So, this noise term we can compute, so we can model, if we, again, so we will compute uh, Sn, which will be 1 over n times the, the sum j going from 0 to n minus 1. And here we will take x of, uh, so it will be j delta. Okay, so maybe minus some periodic component that we know to remove errors from these periodic components. And this thing here, we can consider as a random variable. And now in the uh, computations I did, I assume that these xj are independent and identically distributed. So now it is not quite true that the xj are independent in a, a real situation, but typically what happens is that there's some correlation, but it decreases fast. So we just have to make sure that this delta is a bit larger than the decorrelation time, and we have very similar results. And actually there are generalizations of these uh, results like the law of large numbers and uh, Chebyshev's inequality and so forth, correlated random variables when the correlation decreases. And so now the, the main question is actually how large is this capital N because that will give us the decrease in error that we make. So each xj has a certain magnitude or a certain standard deviation and that we cannot avoid and that could well be something like uh, maybe uh, a meter or that kind of, uh, of magnitude. But now we do this averaging over a large number of measures and uh, so we have to compute the number of measures uh, we have and, and this you find for instance on this website here. So for JSON 1, the website tells me that uh, it, make, it made cycles, and each cycle has a length of about 10 days. So it's not important for the analysis, but I presume that this uh, cycle is the time it takes for the satellite to cover the whole surface of the Earth and come back more or less to its original position and so in in total uh, Jason made 127 cycles and that is during a first uh, period in its period of activity and then they changed the orbit to measure some other things and now if we look at one cycle So one cycle, so it's about 10 days, and this database here tells me that during one cycle the satellite made uh, approximately 250 passes, so I'm assuming a pass is going full circle around the Earth, but then you don't come back to the same point because the Earth has turned. So you, we have 250 passes, so one pass that is about one hour. And the database tells me that during this hour there are 2,500 records. More or less it changes a little bit, but you have the precise data. So on average it's 2,500 records. So that gives me a sampling period of 1.37 seconds. Okay, and 
So, how many records do I have for one cycle? So one roughly 10 days period. Well, it, uh, it will be approximately 250 times 2500. And that is uh, 625,000 records. So if I take an average over this 10 day period, I get an N, capital N, which is this 625,000. So more than half a million. And this means that square root of N, well, if you compute this, that's about 790, almost 800. So this is the factor I gain by variance reduction. So it means that if my standard deviation of the xj, which is my measurement area due to random sources, let's say it's one meter, well, the error I get on this average will be one meter divided by almost 800, which is a bit more than one millimeter. So this is how, thanks to this averaging method, we get actually much more precise measurements than any single measurement would be. So we can go from one meter errors to a bit more than one millimeter with the, these data here. Now you can, you can take longer periods. So if you take one year, you gain another factor of six. And uh, okay, so you have to choose how you take your time windows for the averaging and so on. But the conclusion here is that I think that with this analysis, we see that indeed uh, these satellite data we have, though they have some errors and, and some noise, they are trustworthy. So we have indeed uh, this increase of uh, the figures I showed before, something like 10 centimeters over the last uh, uh, 20, 25 years or so. So that's one thing. The other thing is predictions for what is going to happen, and that is a more difficult thing to do because it requires a lot of modeling and so on. But at least I I think that this uh, increase of sea level is real. Now, 25 centimeters may not seem to be that much, and uh, perhaps it's not that much, but it seems to be accelerating. And what will happen depends a lot on, for one thing, uh, how the global temperature changes, but also there are some tipping points. So for instance, if the West Ar Antarctic ice sheet were to collapse, that will, would contribute quite a lot to sea level rises. And one argument you often get in these discussions is, is that, well, but climate has always changed in the past, so climate change is a natural phenomenon on Earth. Uh, but the issue is actually how fast the climate changes. So if you have a very slow change of sea level over hundreds or thousands of years, human beings will have no problems to adapt. But if it's very fast, if it is over a few dozens of years, it becomes much more challenging to adapt to rising sea levels. All right, so that's it for this presentation. So I hope you liked it. So I hope to see you soon again. So take care. Bye.